I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. Its word will I hide in my heart, that I might not sin against God. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag, and to the Savior from the kingdom of the saints, one brotherhood, uniting all Christians in service and in love. I pledge allegiance to the flag, of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Don't sit down. We're going to sing. We're going to go to um, hymn number 10, and we are going to sing it through twice.
things to take care of for the Constitution and our budget. So we want to make sure that we have enough people there to take care of business. And there's a potluck beforehand, so please make sure that you're here that week. And on the 14th, Thanksgiving dinner after service, if you're interested, the Grace Group would like you to sign up. They're going to provide the turkey, the dressing, gravy, rolls, and then you, we would ask that you would bring a side of salads, desserts, or whatever you would like to go with that. So, okay, on, then I have an announcement. These are out in the foyer. The deacons purchased these for everybody in church to use. It's a daily devotion. And I've noticed that the stack's not going down. I don't know if you didn't realize that the new one's out there or not. So I thought I would announce it so that you knew that it's a great way to strengthen your faith. I start my mornings out with this and with prayer, and it makes my day go a lot better. And I believe and trust the Lord He's going to do the same for you if you take that up. Pardon? And they're free. And they're free. That's right. Okay, we want to wish it dark. Uh, we want to wish happy birthday to Darla Freestone on the. We missed it on the 30th. Dave Hahn is on the 5th. Ray Reinholtz on the 8th, and Bert Swanson on the 14th. For any of you that did not know, Bert got moved to a different place, and there's his new address. So please remember to send him some cards and lift him up in your prayers. Are there any other announcements we want to add to? Dave, Harry. Well, I'm going to stand up here if I can get up. Uh, out on the case or table in the foyer, there's a sign-up sheet. Anybody that wants to help the men's ministry in mowing Becky's lawn, uh, and that may not be a weekly thing. I had put three weeks on there, but it may not be a weekly thing. If you'd signed it up, if three people come to mow, we can knock it out an hour and a half. <laughs> You go there by yourself, it takes you all day. <laughs> no, no, but there's about three and a half acres there to be mowed. And, uh, and uh, Becky will let somebody use her tractor, which gives us a third tractor there, because Jim and I usually bring our own. So keep that in mind. Men can use some help there. There's also a sign-up sheet for the men's Christmas dinner. There's a menu alongside the sign-up sheet. At the top it says, please take a menu and mark your two favorites, your one favorite, whatever. Get it back to me by December the 5th so I can let Portofinos know how much food to order. But put your name on it, circle what, if it takes two items, circle your two items. Make sure you get it back to me. Because we're going to do the Christmas dinner again. And that will be on December the 11th. I don't think I have anything else to say. <laughs> okay. Is there going to be a missions moment about the offering? Pardon? Is somebody going to do a missions moment about the offering? Yeah, we're going to do that now. That's, we're going to do that right now. All right. Why did I sit down? <laughs> so you can get back up. So I can get back up. <laughs> Jeannie mentioned it earlier that the uh, World Mission Offering will be taken in two weeks on the 17th. But what is the World Mission Offering? Through International Ministry World Mission Offering, thousands across the country celebrate and support ministries that God is using to transform the world. For more than 200 years, International Ministries, also known as American Baptist Foreign Mission Society, has combined resilience, adaptability, and creative approaches to cross-cultural ministry with faithfulness to Scripture. We serve together with and learn from our many local partners in ministry around the globe. During the 2021 World Mission Offering, we highlight the work of global ministers, I guess you pronounce his name, Kepley and Vital Pierre in the Dominican Republic as they provide education, Bible studies, language classes, a micro-loan program, legal counseling, and more for Haitian immigrants facing 
inequity and maltreatment in the Dominican Republic. We highlight global servants Elise and Mark, and I don't know how to pronounce that name, but I'm going to say Funes. Sounds good, doesn't it? As they talk about their ministry of practical care and love for all the Hill Tribe children in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And as many of you know, Pastor Ron and I got to be a part of a mission trip, and we were in Chiang Mai. And that, we highlight the impact of global servant Ricardo Mayola Rosero's ministry as he serves and stands alongside communities in Latin America trying to access clean water and air. Through these three ministries, we have a glimpse into what God is doing through international ministries. 120 plus global servants, 900 plus volunteers, home staff, and 250 plus international partners in 70 countries. We hope and pray as a mission committee here at Mill Creek that you will take part and the incredible work that God is doing around the world. We can help financially. We may not be able to go physically, but we can help financially support the World Mission Offering. Will you join with us as we work together with international ministries? <coughs> to invite people to become disciples of Christ and to proclaim through both word and deed God's reign of love, grace, mercy, peace, and abundant life for all of creation, his creation. We will receive the World Mission Offering on October 17th, and again, our goal is $1,500. Thank you. Okay, if you'd open your Bibles up to Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 4, that is the call of worship today. When you find it, if you would please stand. We're looking for Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 4. Let's bow our head. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your throne room. We thank you that it's our time to worship you and to praise you and to be thankful hearts for all you do for us, Lord. We thank you for your presence with us and just ask that you would guide and direct us every mind, thought, every thought and every mind, hearts and eyes and ears, Father, that it would always be, always be pleasing to you. So would you please add a blessing to the reading of this word that we will use it to help to further your kingdom in Christ's holy name. Amen. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in those last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heirs of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's grace and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majestic in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. We thank you for the reading of the word, Lord, and just praise you and thank you for that. Okay, now is the time for praise and prayer. Does anybody have any praises that they want to offer up? It's been a beautiful couple, a week or so of harvest for the farmers with dry weather and getting a lot done. The beans are coming out right and left. That's a good thing. I, hopefully they have a good crop and helps the food prices for everybody. 
There are other requests for anything? Donna? Uh, just an update on Ginger. She started out August 25th with her radiation treatments over in Illinois. And she had to do 40 of them this week. Tomorrow, we'll do, she's got 14 more to go. So she's coming out. The only thing going on is she is losing her hair a little bit. Not as bad as she thought. But um, just her two and a half more weeks of driving all the time and get that miles under the belt. Hope the weather stays good so they don't have to drive in the rain because her appointment isn't until 6 o'clock at night. So it's a long day because she heard I go to work in the mornings and she'll work till about 2 and then come home, get in the car, and go to Warrensville and they get home about 9 o'clock at night. So long days, but God's with them and taking good care of her. He is very faithful. We'll continue to pray for gender and the travel mercies also. That traveling can get to you after a while, so our hearts go out to her. Any other praises or prayer requests? Dave? Chip, Chip and Phyllis aren't here today. Uh, they finally got closed on their house and the one that they bought, and uh, they've been very busy moving. <laughs> uh, I think it's been rough on Chuck. He's my brother. I said him and Ron were the two brothers I never had biologically. But they've been in their home 54 years. Hard to leave something, huh? And to give that up. But they also realize in those 54 years how much stuff <laughs> they've accumulated in making the move. Uh, and I know Chuck feels bad because of his physical condition, that he can't help more than he does. I told him, I says, Chuck, you can still sit there, bark orders out, and pray. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that things go well, and so far they have gone pretty, pretty well. Uh, people that were moving out, they were a little late getting out Friday, and my wife spent, I don't know what time she went there, but I had to go chase her down and say, all of you go home. It was 8.30 or so at night. And uh, so just remember Chuck and Phyllis as they make the move. And then I want to ask, probably within the next month, I'm going to have to have a knee replaced. But I've got about two weeks worth of work that I need to get done at the house before I do that. So. I just ask that God gives me the strength to get that, those jobs done. Or the wisdom if you should or shouldn't get them done. Pardon? How's that? I said, and the wisdom to know if you should or shouldn't get them done. How about that? Well, <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a new address for Chuck and Bella? Do you have a new address, anybody? We'll have to get that and we'll put that in the bulletin for us. For uh, Chuck and Bella? Yes. What's the street, Carol? You know? I don't know the street. I don't know the street. The house? Yeah, we'll get, we'll get that out. We'll yeah, get we it should get it out so we can put it in our directory and we have it. Yeah. We'll get it to Gail this week and have it put in the bulletin for next week. Okay, is there any other prayer requests or praises? Pretty quiet. Julie. So I apologize. This is actually an announcement. My love for girls reserves at the high school that are doing a fundraiser, she's selling pies. Um, for those that don't know, girls reserves is a volunteer organization at the high school where the girls get to you know, go and do various volunteer opportunities. So it's, it's a good club for those get involved in. They're doing a fundraiser, they're selling pies for $20. The options are pumpkin, blueberry, Dutch apple, or cherry. So she has a sign up here if anybody's interested in buying the pies. And I noticed that the pies are being made locally by Jenny Ray's restaurant, so that's a good thing. They're not frozen pies that you go to any place to buy. 
Jamie. Okay, I didn't hear what you said, hon. Pray for you, you're going to do something. Uh, we've been praying in over so that's why I mean, but, uh, I'm having problems with my kidney shut down. So, uh, kind of, uh, you know, I believe in God and believe in prayer in over so you guys pray for me. Hopefully, it's just something simple and not very complicated. Okay, we're going to pray for you for kidney function repair. Or our Lord is more than able. And he says, you have not because you ask not. And I believe in asking. Okay, is there anybody else? All right, Pastor, would you like to come up and pray for us and with us, please? Thank you. God, we set this time aside in the service to honor uh, the, the needs of your people, the requests that have been made. Uh, Lord, the only reason we do this, or maybe the main reason we do this, is because we honor you. We honor your, your calling to prayer and the, the simple fact that you are a God who is great and mighty and that you have shown yourself to be faithful to your promises. Each person that's been lifted up, each need that's been lifted up, Lord, we lay before your feet right now. We do so with the conviction that you hear us. We do so with the assurance that you work in ways that are marvelous. Provide healing, provide strength, provide grace that is entirely sufficient. In and around all of that, Lord, we pray that as we move through times of concern and worry and pain and suffering that we would be a light to those around us not so that people would admire our faith but they would look to you and say and recognize how great you are may our witness be clear for you Lord and may you touch us in ways that cause us to be awestruck. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Okay, I feel to uh, introduce you to the pastor, uh, Dr. Bruce Cochran. He's with the ABC, uh, the Indiana and Kentucky region, from our state office, and he's filling in for Josh this morning, and we're thrilled to have him. But in case some of you didn't know him, I, he's been in our church for years as an out and out, so I just been looking for pretty much like a friend. So I'm sorry I neglected for those of you who are newer that it may not realize who he was. So we want to welcome him today. Thank you for coming. Time to stand up. reminds us each Sunday there's offering plates at the back there's offering plates at the front uh, we, let's pray dear God and Heavenly Father I, I thank you for this time of worship this time when we can return a portion of what you have so generously blessed us with I pray that you will give us the wisdom to use it to use it wisely and according to your will as we continue to minister here in Mill Creek. 
and around the state and the world. And I ask it all in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Don't sit down. We're going to sing. <laughs> You'd almost think we was a Catholic church as much as we get up and down. <laughs> Let's turn to page 12. Praise him, praise him. And we're kind of low in numbers today, so you're going to have to sing double loud. So.
morning. <laughs> I was supposed to do communion, and since we're not doing communion. So anyway, um, you know how growing up and, and uh, you kind of start learning people's favorite hymns to sing. I think that what we just sang was your dad's favorite, right, Carol? Um, what a friend we have in Jesus was Walt's favorite. And I know Jeannie's favorite is In the Garden. And Pastor Ron's was always wonderful grace of Jesus. And uh, so anytime we would have one of those, you know, anybody pick a favorite, that was the ones that we'd have to, uh, we'd have to sing and play. My grandpa's was uh, uh, the old rugged cross. That was one of the first things I learned to play on the piano. But uh, when I was growing up in the church that I grew up in down in Franklin, um, our pastor's wife was, um, her name was Carol Bush, and uh, her favorite was I'd Rather Have Jesus. And uh, it's become one of my favorites, too. I can't say that I have a favorite. I like so many of them. So uh, I thought we'll sing this today for Carol. Carol's going to heaven. So. Mm -hmm.
for that. Uh, appreciate the Jesus talk this morning and the Jesus songs. Now, what would, where would we be without Jesus? Well, we wouldn't be here. I can tell you that right now. And uh, we, our lives would indeed be in a different, different uh, place and different position. And maybe some of you can remember in your life at a time that you didn't have Jesus. And uh, that is a, it's a sweet contrast. So if you're like me, you, uh, you may have been raised in the church and it's really hard to ever recall a time when Jesus wasn't a part of your life and your, the, the talk of, of your life. But uh, that makes no difference. You know, if you have Jesus right now, that's the key. Amen? Amen. Amen. So thank you so much. Um, uh, appreciate uh, being here today. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're always told that when you uh, uh, speak to people, you have to make a connection. So I'll, I do want to reiterate a little bit about who I am so that you will know who's talking to you today. Uh, coming up on six years now as serving as your region minister in in American Baptist Churches of Indiana, Kentucky. Prior to that, I was a, an interim minister and I served as pastor of First Baptist Church in Seymour for 22 years. And then it uh, starts to get an ancient history beyond that, but uh, I was out in California for a little while in Michigan as a pastor. But uh, we have, I live in Fishers right now. My wife and I have two sons, two best mistakes we ever made. And uh, they, one of them lives in Fort Wayne and he has Four children. He and his wife have four children. He's a pastor there in Fort Wayne. Mother's son is in sales, and he lives in the Indianapolis area. And his and he and his wife have one child. And so, um, if you want to look at, I'll show you pictures of grandchildren later. If my wife is here, she'd already be showing them to you. So be thankful that uh, for that. Uh, but it is a blessing to be with you. It's a blessing to serve in this capacity and to assist churches and assist the church leaders in the in the calling that God has for them as they do their as they do that do the work that God calls them to. Appreciate your emphasis on the world mission offering. For sure, our missionaries are are sharp people. We have some tremendous missionaries working uh, in the United States or and all around the world. And if you have ever rubbed shoulders with them, uh, then you know what I'm talking about. As I've assume this position, I've been able to become closer and closer contact with our mission people. And uh, I knew that, always knew that they were top drawer, but uh, now I'm convinced of it, you know. And so I appreciate your support of American Baptist Missions all the way across the board. So thank you so much for that. Okay, so we've made a connection now, right? We're good friends, right? Okay, so let's, let's, look, at the, uh, let's look at the message for this day. Uh, we live in a time where there are a lot of questions a lot of questions about, uh, for instance, where the church is headed. Uh, I, you can imagine that I have conversations with church, uh, church leaders and pastors all the time, and uh, we, we, we think, what's going to happen with the church? In 10 years, where will this church be? Where will our churches be? And we think about dwindling resources, we think about declining, um, declining attendances, Attendance. We think about the role that the church has in society today, and we understand that as something different than it had 10, 20, or 30 years ago. And it doesn't seem as if we have the voice that we used to have. And these are all things that concern us if we are, if we, if we love the church and if we love our church, and um, we wring our hands sometimes about that, and are indeed deeply concerned. But what if, what if all the things that I've just shared with you about what we look at and see happening uh, with the church and to the church, what if they are, that's not, those are not really the real problems. What if they are, all those things are just simply symptomatic of a deeper issue? And the deeper issue is not something that's happening outside the church, but something that's happened inside the church. What if we are in the boat we are in today because we have lost our way? What if, we are, what if we have lost our heart? What if, what if we are here today because we are not doing as Proverbs 4.23 says, watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life or the issues of life. Maybe what we're looking at is that the issues of life are coming home to roost, so to speak. 
And we begin, we need to get back to where we are looking over our heart and taking care of this spiritual issue of faith that we have been called to tend to. Well, if that's, if that's at all true, or if any measure of it is true, then we need to see that the, the, the decline in attendance, the decline in resources, and the loss of influence is simply the, the result of not being the people that God has called us to be. And we're not watching over, or we haven't been watching over our heart. And if that indeed is in any way connected with the issues that we face today, what would looking over our heart look like? What would it look like to be faithful in watching over the most important thing that God has given us, and that is that place where Christ resides in us? The title of the sermon today is The End of Prayer. And so we're going to be looking at watching over our heart as it applies to are the discipline of prayer. Now, I'm not going to be trying to teach you how to pray today. It's really not that hard. Praying is talking and listening to God, is having a conversation with God. But I'm going to consider giving you some encouragement today, reasons to be about the business of praying. And so what is the end of prayer? And by end, I don't mean how we close our prayers, the words we use, the formula we use, usually something like in Jesus' name, amen. I'm not talking about how we end our prayers, nor are we talking about the end of prayer in certain terms of some kind of eschatological time frame where there'll be a time in history where prayer will end and we will no longer need to do it. We're not looking at any of those kind of things, but by end, I'm going to look at it from the perspective of the outcome or the results. When we engage in prayer, what can we anticipate will happen? Where will the exercise of prayer end up? Now, too often, we're hoping that when we pray, then that will make the church bigger again. Bigger than it is now. And that's looking at it from the perspective of somewhat a backwards look. You know, Jesus admonished the religious leaders of his day. And he said, you bring people into, the, into, your, into your circle, into, your, into the synagogue, and you make them twice the devil that you are. What Jesus was saying was, you know, your heart's all messed up. And when I, when I, when we read that, I don't know about you, but the, the thing that scares me the most about all the things that Jesus had to say is that he had his harshest words for the religious good people of the day. Have you ever heard, you ever realize that? Boy, Jesus smacked us around pretty bad. That scares me. And so, instead of saying, okay, let's, let's pray so the church gets bigger, we need to be praying so, so that we get better. And that our hearts are right. And that we pray with an attitude that draws us into a sense of humility before the Lord. And we are speaking out of a heart that loves the Lord and loves people. So when we pray rightly like this, with the right heart, the right attitude, the right pur purpose, then there are certain ends that might result from that. And so what are those ends? For one, prayer will end up with a testimony. Now, a testimony is simply an evidence of an experience. You know, we see testimonies on TV all the time. Somebody gives a testimony of some weight loss program, you know. They show the before and then the after picture, you know. That's a testimony. That's a testimony. There are all kinds of testimonies on TV of things like that. And so, Ebenezer Scrooge, for instance, how did that story end? He started, the story started out and he was a miserly, mean, old, selfish guy. But in the course of the, the story of his life, in the story of that night, he turned into a generous person. 
And his generosity was a testimony of something that had happened to him, a changed heart. And so his testimony was, was one of generosity. We have testimony time in churches every now and then. And oftentimes in the testimony time in churches, there'll be a, a moment, there'll be somebody who talks about how the Lord has touched their lives. And how they've walked down an aisle and found Jesus and they, they followed him in baptism and their life has never been the same. That's a great testimony. I hope that all of you can, 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 can verbalize the time or times when your life, when you have given over your heart to Jesus and there's been a, cha there's been a change. But what always kind of bothers me when I hear, when I have, when, we, when, when I'm in a, one of those testimony times is that I hear people talking about something that happened to them like that 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And the question that comes up is, what about this year? What about this month? What about this week? Can you give a testimony of how God has been working in your life recently? Or is the only testimony that you have something that happened a long time ago? And so we're looking for, we're looking for testimonies when we pray. We're looking for God to answer our prayers. You see, being prayed up in this manner uh, ends up with testimonies that are like the blind man had when Jesus touched him. And they're all trying to, explore, they're all trying to ask this blind man, how come, you're, how come you know, this all happened? And the guy says, you know, I don't know anything else to tell you. I used to be blind, but now Jesus touched me, and now I see. What other kind of testimonies can you have? I'd love to share with you how uh, the Lord gave my son a job. I've been praying about that. Or how the Lord has been touching a friend of mine who's had cancer. The doctors are kind of scratching their heads because there's healing happening in ways that they can't quite understand. What about testimonies of, of that nature that, that, that apply to situations around you that are, that are current, that are right now happening? Because you can pray for those things. And then when you pray for them, you start looking for them. And then in looking for them, you see God acting, and you have a testimony that reflects what God is doing for right now. See, prayer creates a testimony because it puts us in a position to experience God. God works through, He works in, He works by people who are praying. I had a mentor in ministry who frequently said that there is nothing of eternal consequence that happens outside of prayer. <clears throat> just, just let that settle in a little bit. Because oftentimes I fear that we have come to the, to the conclusion that nothing of eternal consequence happens outside of a board meeting. Or nothing of eternal consequence happens outside of a program. Friends, nothing of eternal consequence happens outside of God's action. That happens through prayer. We can have all the programs in the world, all the, all the board meetings in the world, all the offerings and the, and, the, and the worship services in the world. If God is not present, it's for naught. And so when we pray, we pray for God to come into those things. God bless what we do. And in the, in the process of, of that blessing, we can look at this and God had his hand on that. Look what God's doing over here. We may have been a part of it, but you know, it wasn't us. It was God. And see, so prayer puts us in a, in a, in a, in a situation of, of, of a frame of mind where we see, can see God working. What testimonies do Christians have today? How is God showing up? How is the Holy Spirit working? If there are no testimonies, then that simply means there is likely no or little prayer. So in the, bottom, the bottom line is this. When we pray, God works. When God works, we have a testimony about that. Or another way to look at this. 
What, 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 are test, what other ways will our test, what other things will our testimonies be about? When we pray, we'll, we will experience peace from God. The antidote to anxiety is prayer. Hope you're convinced of that. As Christians, we will find our hearts and minds guarded by the peace of God, which is incomprehensible. And we all want that peace that surpasses all understanding. I have a friend I, 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 I haven't seen for a long time. I saw her about a month ago. And this was a, this was a lady a little bit older than I was. And, and she has had a tremendously difficult life. One of those kind of things that, you know, that you just look at her and you think, how can anybody survive all of that? You know that you know the, 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 these kind of people. But everywhere she went, she was just smiling. Just had the sweetest spirit. I'd see her come down the hallway and I said, there's the most caustic person I know. And she just smiled because she knew I was pulling her leg. Just a beautiful person. And well, she had just gone through a difficult time with her mother. Her mother had gone through a long, agonizing illness and she just this mother of her mother just died and I, I touched base with her just to say how you doing and she says you know it's it was hard it was really hard but it's okay what does that say to you it, it was still hard she's not denying it's not pie in the sky kind of thing but through all that difficulty through all that agony through all the pain that she experienced with her mother she had some kind of incomprehensible peace. And that was her testimony, see? Because she was praying for that, praying about that. Well, another way to look at that is we have strength from God. Paul talked, uh, prayed that the, the Ephesians might be strengthened in the inner man. And when we need to be strong, Christians can likewise pray for that strength and Boy, I tell you what, doesn't, you don't have to live very long before you say, I, I could use a little bit more strength right now. Example of this would be a conversation I've had with the pastor. It's, it's been a hard time the last year and a half for everybody. It's been a hard time for anybody who's trying to lead. It's been a hard time for pastors. Hard time for pastors. Trying to sort things out. You know, even on a good day, we all say you can't please everybody, right? Well, now we're saying you can't please anybody. You know? And uh, talking with this one particular pastor who had, you know, not, a, not only the COVID issues, but had some staff issues that somebody, that, that got thrown into the middle of that, that morass of, of mess. Trying to help him through it and talk him, uh, talk him through it. And he said this. He says, I look at all this around me and it is a mess. But you know something? I am so rich because God's walking with me. See, that's strength. That's strength. It's not pretending that there aren't problems. The problems are still there. But walking through them with the strength of God is entirely different. That is a result of prayer. That is the result of prayer. So we have, we have peace. We can talk about the peace we have from God. We can talk about the strength we have from God. When we pray, we'll also experience opportunities from God. Paul realized that God provided him opportunities to teach others. That was his calling. And so he, he prayed for opportunities that, that God would open doors for him to do what God has called him to do. And so he requested prayer that opportunities would come and that they would continue. And what prayer does for opportunities is it causes us to look for them and in looking we can see them and in seeing them we can seize upon them and in seizing upon them we can see God work through them. But it begins with prayer. You've heard the, the phrase before, to a hammer everything is a nail. To, to those who pray for opportunities, everything becomes an opportunity. Why? Because it gives you eyes to see them. But oftentimes, we're so overwhelmed with whatever problems that we may have, which may be substantial, that we are, 
It's like we have blinders on and we do not see the opportunities that are all around us. But when we, when we stop and we take moments from time to time and say, Lord, give me an opportunity to be a witness for you, to be a, the light for you, to be the salt in this, this disintegrating world. When we pray for those, it opens our eyes to them because then we're looking for them. And we can say, we go back to our prayer list. We say, Lord, I prayed for this opportunity. And lo and behold, look, you gave it to me. And oftentimes, when you reflect back upon it in your prayer, you can say, you know, you gave me the opportunity, but I didn't seize upon it. But that's a learning experience for us, right? We say, the next time, Lord, give me that opportunity, and I will follow through with it. But the whole idea of praying for opportunities gives us the sense in which we are open to them. Because we're ready for them. And opportunities come as we pray for them, partly because, not just because God answers our prayer, but because it equips us to lay hold of them, to see them and lay hold of them. So things like peace and strength and opportunity, those will be the testimonies that we have. Or we can talk about this from the perspective of fruit. What is the fruit of the Christian life? The psalmist wrote, those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Those who go out weeping, that's the prayer part. That's the prayer part. I am, as I am going, I am just asking God to bless and to encourage and to give me the opportunities. That's the weeping part. That's the prayer part. But then there is the going out. We have to move. We have to do our part. And so the weeping is half the equation. Prayer is the other half, the action. And out of this, there's the fruit of souls. You know what happens when we pray for those who are lost that stimulates us to have passion for those who are lost. Because see, when we pray for those who are outside of the family of God, then we are touching on a part of what God is in terms of God's love for those who are outside the family of God. You see, we touch God's heart. And in touching God's heart, we're touched by the same kind of passion and love that God has. If there's one thing that God loves, it's those who are lost. He loves the lost so much that he came, he sent his son to die for the lost. And so the, the whole idea of praying for the lost, it's, it's, it's multi-layered, but in some ways it's very simple. Praying for the lost is just like praying for opportunities. It, it causes us to see and love the lost as God loves the lost. So when we pray for opportunities to be a, a witness or the light to others, then God will give us those opportunities, but it also changes our heart to love people in that way. Another kind of fruit is spiritual maturity, which can be described as a consistency in our walk with Christ that's marked by good spiritual habits that we nurture. Things like prayer itself, or Bible study, or, or witnessing, or giving, or what you're doing here today, regularly gathering with God's people. All those things are built up and established and maintained by consistent prayer. When we pray, we get in touch with God, see? And there is something within our hearts that is discomforted when we're in touch with God if we're not seeing that kind of growth in our heart. There's something that says, you know, God, I'm not where I need to be. Help me take a small step towards that. And that can be part of our testimony. That can be part of what we can see God doing in our lives when we begin to pray for that kind of maturity to develop and to grow in us. I heard a story once of a group of people who were in dire straits. And it looked as though you know, this was not going to work out for them at all. And someone said, in the midst of that turmoil they were in, they said, well, I guess we should just pray. And someone else said, oh my, has it come to that? 
you understand the humor in that, but there's a tragedy in that, isn't it? Isn't there? Oftentimes we kind of think, well, we'll do everything we can, and if we, if we run out of gas, then we'll ask God to pray. We'll ask God to do something, and we'll pray. Oswald Sanders said that prayer does not fit or equip us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. Prayer is not the last piece of work. It's the first thing we do. And so today, as we think about this, this, this idea of who we are as a church and where the church is going, let's begin to wonder and consider the fact that it might be the consequence of who we become as God's people. And regardless of whether or not there are other issues there, that's part of the, that's part of the solution be the best that we can be in Jesus Christ. So may we, may we engage this day, this season that we find ourselves in with all the challenges and curiosities and puzzling moments and questions and opportunities. Let's engage that with prayer. Oh God, may this, may this congregation uh, continue on the path of prayer that they are on and may they May they, may they pick it up as well. May they engage you in a way, Lord, that recognizes a deep-seated problem in us when we, when we just look at prayer as something that's on the sideline. Lord, make it front and center for us. And of course, Lord, just as we've already honored Jesus in our songs today. May we honor Jesus in our prayers and realize that it is through the work of your spirit that you bring miracles to, to our lives and, around, and to those around us. May you do this, Father, in and through us, even today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I think you normally have a closing him right now, so it looks like we're going to look at 596 as we close, and this will be a time for you to stand.
but we are your people, Lord. And you are our shepherd. God, and bless this people, Lord. Make us, Lord, the people that you call us to be. And help us to be closer to you today than we were yesterday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.